live. All right. Just give people a second to make sure their their internet is working. They're actually able to to see what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> where are you located? In uh, Golden, Colorado. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, very cool. All right. Well, let's get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. And uh, in addition to all the news we report, all the questions we answer, I like to bring you behind the scenes. And you can see the discussions that I have with the researchers who are actually doing on the work that we're reporting for Universe Today. And today I'm joined by uh, Kevin Cannon from the Colorado Mines. Is that right? Uh, and Colorado School of Mines. Co Colorado School of Mines. That's right. And um, and we're going to be talking about lunar regolith. So, so who are you? What do you do? Yeah, so I'm a, a planetary geologist. So I study rocks on other planetary bodies. And specifically, I'm part of our space resources program here at MINE. So this is kind of a one-of-a-kind of a, one of a program where we are uh, learning how to use materials in space uh, to support kind of long-term exploration and expansion of, of humanity. So what is regolith? Yeah, so regolith, you can think of it as kind of a soil um, that's found on the surface of, of almost every planetary body, uh, Mercury, Moon, Mars, etc. And it's really formed by uh, repeated bombardments by asteroids and comets slamming into those bodies and breaking apart the rocks. Uh, and it basically breaks them down and grinds them down into dust and sand. And so that loose material that covers the surface, that's what we call the, the regolith. And, and if you could like put your hands in regolith, and sort of just feel it in your hands. What would it What would it feel like? Similar to something we might be more familiar with. Yeah, it might feel like a, a mix of maybe you took like beach sands and flour from your kitchen and mix those together. Huh. And get something, some combination of that. And how big are the are the particle sizes? Oh, we're talking about tens to hundreds of microns. So, about you know a little bit finer than. Uh, like a fine grained sand on a beach that you find. Right. Now, you came to my attention, you and were part of a team that just did a very comprehensive piece of research on, I guess, like, w how are we going to deal with this stuff? And so before we get to the how are we going to deal with this stuff? Let's talk about why it's such a problem. So why is lunar regolith specifically going to be such a problem for the exploration and ideally having a, a you know, a station on the moon? Yeah, so if we go back to the Apollo experience, so we had six moon landings where the astronauts actually got out, walked around, took samples, deployed experiments. And the the dust on the moon, which is kind of the, the finest, uh, the finest grains of, of the regolith, that really plagued a lot of the uh, activities that the astronauts tried to do. So that material got all over their suits and not just, you know, on the surface of the suits, but actually really worked its way into the fabric itself. Um, it got into any kind of equipment that had moving parts or gears. It would penetrate into those uh, and kind of affected their performance. Uh, one of the things, if you have like a radiator in space, that's really important because things get pretty hot in a vacuum and you have to try and radiate away the heat. And if your radiator is covered in dust, then, you know, it's not going to work properly. Same thing for optical surfaces, solar panels. So just overall, you know, really uh, presented a lot of challenges to the Apollo astronauts. Also, uh, you know, they breathed it, breathed it in when they came back inside their, uh, their ascent vehicle. Um, so there's some toxicity hazards. So overall, just kind of a, a problem that, uh, you know, we have to contend with as we go back to the moon and then on to Mars. Now, was this a surprise to NASA? Um, I think the extent uh, of, of the problem was, was a surprise. I think they knew they were going to be dealing with a, a fine grade material, but just how um, it's, its ability to get into stuff and to wreck equipment, I think, was came as quite a surprise. I mean, I, I kind of know that experience. Like you spend a day at the beach and you're just finding sand everywhere. It's in your car. It's in your clothes, and it's not until you've had a chance to like have a shower, wash all your clothes, you know, clean the car. Like this stuff's finally gone, and those are fairly big particles. Those are boulders compared to some of this, this regolith. Were they able to mitigate it in any way during the mission when they started to realize that this was a problem? Yeah, so I think it really came between the missions. So you would have you know Apollo eleven, and then as they're prepping for 
Apollo 12, they kind of try and take those lessons learned and apply them and modify the equipment in real time. Um, in terms of, you know, when they were actually outdoors um, on the surface, there wasn't all that much they could do. Uh, they had some rudimentary tools, like some brushes they could use to try and, uh, you know, brush the dust off. Um, but really it came from that kind of debrief, getting back to earth and saying, okay, how can we improve this piece of equipment to, to better handle it next time? And so they actually did redesign or improve various pieces of equipment on the Apollo missions after these lessons they learned on the first one. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Wow. Okay. Um, so then like, if like, you know, and these were all just like, in some cases, a few hours on the moon, later cases, several days on the moon, but that's nothing compared to a long term presence on the moon. And so what do we think this stuff would do over days, weeks, months, even even years? Yeah, so when you get into those long time scales, you start to worry more about things like abrasion. So abrasion is a it's a form of wear where it's it's just kind of breaking down materials over time that are in contact with uh, with the dust. So, for example, if you had a wheel on a rover, you know that's constantly being uh, driven over the surface, that might wear down over time. So I think that's going to be more of the the challenge long term is abrading materials and then also if you have for example solar panels uh you know those getting covered with dust you'd have to have a, a way to kind of clean them off periodically so i think there are some unique challenges of, of long-term uh sustained presence that uh that the, that the dust would present and and i mean you're talking about the just the mechanical wear but what about the health issues because i've heard it can be you know it's like little pieces of glass in your lungs Right. And people have done a lot of work since Apollo with the samples that were brought back um, doing biological experiments, right? Testing the effects of, of the dust and those grains on different types of tissues, lung tissues from, from different, uh, different species. And so that is a concern. And I think that's where you have to really think hard about what is your airlock going to look like? What are your procedures going to look like? So every time you go outside that you're not traipsing uh, the dust back in. Um, people have come up with concepts where, for example, the, the suit could actually be kind of on the outside of the habitat and you would kind of step into it uh, and then and then walk out. So I think that's that's really going to be important is the, the airlock, trying to separate the dust from the interior of a, of a habitat or a spaceship. But like, are we are we thinking about like like uh, cancer? Like, um, like, do we know like what some of these these impacts might be? Yeah, so I think you'd be concerned about things like uh, diseases similar to silicosis. Uh, so that's something seen on Earth with uh, people who work in very dusty environments, like tile cutting factories um, over long periods of time of exposure. Uh, they can develop diseases of the lung, things like lung cancer, silicosis. Um, so that would be a concern. Um, I think you'd have to have monitoring in place, uh, you know, monitoring the amount of dust that's that's in a habitat um, and really trying to keep it keep it out of the habitat as, right. as much as possible. So let's talk about your research then. Uh, you know, what were you what were you tr trying to, to work out? Yeah, so we tried to do two things with uh, with this particular study. So we looked at this, this suite of technologies that people have proposed to mitigate against dust. Uh, and that could span the range from preventing dust from sticking to something in the first place, uh, or not even, you know, not generating the dust, not kicking it up, um, all the way to technologies that could remove dust once it's on a surface or once it's worked into a, a fabric. Uh, so we looked at those technologies, and then we also looked at technologies to move the regolith around on the surface. So if you wanted to do something like mining or excavation or build structures, like do 3D printing with the regolith, uh, you're going to need to move it around and work with it. Um, and that is also going to kind of present a hazard because that starts to, to you know, generate the dust. So we looked at those two sets of, of technologies, one for mitigating dust, and one for move it, moving regolith around, um, and really tried to compare and see which technologies are out there that are uh, the, the most effective um, for, for lunar surface uh, and, and I would, and I would wonder, like, I would think that the kinds of mitigation practices here on Earth, like, like water or gravity <laughs> would would help in certain ways, ventilation systems, etc. A lot of those in the vacuum of space on the moon, you just can't employ them. 
Exactly right. So you go yeah. out to any construction site and you'll see dust kind of billowing around. Dust doesn't billow on the moon, right? Because there's there's no atmosphere. It just travels in kind of straight line ballistic trajectories. And what you'll see on these construction sites is they're, you know, they're spraying water to kind of tamp down the dust uh, to precipitate it. That's not going to work in a vacuum. So we really have to get a little bit more creative with with the types of solutions that, uh, that we come up with. Yeah. So so let's explore those solutions. So which, you know, what did you what did you find out? Yeah, so we looked at uh, a whole bunch. So I'll just I'll highlight a couple. Um, one that's really interesting is something called a, a lotus leaf coating. Uh, so lotus leaves on Earth, they have this really interesting property. You can look at some some videos on YouTube. If you pour water onto a, a lotus leaf, it will really just uh, you know wick right off. It's a it's known as a, a super hydro, hydrophobic uh, mm. surface. So that's just something that that nature has come up with. Uh, it's evolved over time. Um, but what people have done is to to take inspiration from that and design mechanical surfaces that have the same kind of textured coating as a lotus leaf. Um, the idea is that the dust grains, when they're in contact with that surface, um, it's really only there's kind of these like ridges or points on the surface. And so the dust grain is in contact with that and not the actual surface itself. So that's a really cool idea um, that, you know, you could apply this texture to uh, to a panel or the outside of a habitat. Um, and that would, in theory, prevent the dust from from sticking to it in, in the first place. Oh, interesting. And so and so like you would have some panel you'd have the it would be shedding off this dust and then that would just sort of stop this problem right from the very beginning because then you wouldn't be tracking it to the next place bringing into the into the airlock etc etc exactly and that that's only going to work with kind of hard surfaces so metals or or glasses or ceramics um so that's not going to work for for example your your spacesuits or Mm. rather soft fabrics is it is this surface complicated to apply? Is it, uh, you know, thinking about, like, is it the kind of thing that you would apply on Earth? Or is it something that you could actually apply while you're in space? Uh, yeah, I think you'd apply it uh, on Earth before you send whatever the, the piece or the panel is. Um, it's it's fairly straightforward. It's in the kind of a, a family of surface finishes or coatings uh, that would be applied to, to different materials on Earth. So it's not not all that complicated. Is there? Is there? I'm trying to think. Like again, is there like a place I might be able to have? Ex- would I have already experienced something like this? What would it feel like? Um, I'd say these these this class of super hydrophobic surfaces is maybe a little bit uh, uh, on the cutting edge. So it's probably not in a lot of consumer products. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it it is out there. People are experimenting with it. I know I've seen, for example, there was a concept to do uh, like like. Uh, apply a, a surface like that to ketchup bottles, the glass ketchup bottles, and then the ketchup will just kind of slide right out. And oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's, you know, it's on the, it's kind of in the research stage still hasn't been widely applied. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so so that in other words, anything that you can feasibly cover with this coating or make out of one of these materials, do that. Um, but what about the, uh, what about the softer materials? Yeah, so that's where you'd be looking to um, get into what are called more active dust mitigation. So the the lotus leaf, that's more of a passive system. It just kind of sits there and then tries to shed the dust off that that comes into contact with it. Um, When the dust is already stuck to a surface, you want to use some kind of active measure to try and remove it. So uh, people have come up with different types of brushes um, uh, that could, you know, try and get the dust out. Um, they've come up with electromagnetic solutions. So maybe you try and, uh, you know, use a magnetic field or an electric field to to uh, remove the dust to kind of get it out of something or, or off of something. So, so why does why would an electromagnetic solution work? Yeah, so you're you're trying to basically put a charge on the grains and then repel them from the surface they're attached to. Um, or in the case of magnetic fields, uh, you're relying on the fact that the lunar regolith is is naturally magnetic, and so you're uh, you know trying to attract it using a magnetic field. What is the source of that natural magnetism? Yeah, so that would be um, iron uh, in different particles uh, in the regolith. Um, so okay. there are different different minerals that have uh, certain amounts of iron in them that uh, are naturally magnetic. But I know that like 
you can get like the, the actual surface of the moon is electrostatically charged. In fact, as the as the day length goes on, the the regolith will rise up and and move around, which is a, another problem that I was hoping that we could get into as well. But just that is that playing a part of it. So even if they don't necessarily have iron particles in them, you've still got some kind of charge on a lot of these these fine grains. Yeah, that's right. And so depending on maybe the time of day, um, that could affect whether you're applying, you know, a positive charge or a negative charge. Um, but you want to, you want to have a differential charge. So, so they're repelled from whatever surface they're, they're attached to. How much, how much of it can you shift in that extent? And like, what is the mechanism for, for doing it? Are you like, are you carrying around yeah, so an electromagnet? How would, how would that work? Yeah, people have tried to come up with something like a like a wand, um, you know, something you would go through. Uh, like oh, I see. Pat it down in security, so maybe you could have a wand that's putting out uh, a field, and you just kind of you know uh, hover it over a, a suit or, or a piece of fabric. That sounds slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The active, you know, the the active dust mitigation is probably going to be applied to fairly small surfaces, whereas I think things like large. Uh, panels on the edge of a habitat or something, that's probably where you're going to employ your, your more passive measures. Once, like how, how, and so back to that question that I had mentioned before, like how much does this stuff get around? Like if you're, if you're spending most of your time on the base and let's say you've, you've 3D printed or you've, or you've late, you've got concrete around mooncrete around your, your base is is a lot of new dust if you if you're sweeping the space off is a lot of new dust making its way on that you have to deal with or once you've mitigated it is can you sort of then as long as you stay within the safe areas you don't have to worry too much about it yeah so that's one option is you could if you're going to be working or or having a habitat on one particular area you could do something like try and sieve out all the all the fine grained dust and just be left with like a gravel surface that would help um, people have talked oh, about maybe melting, melting the surface um, to kind of create like a, a glass sheet. Um, so that kind of large scale surface per, uh, preparation is is possible. Um, oh, well, hold on, I just want to stop yeah. on that for one second because it's really interesting. So you could like have a tractor that's covered in in this mitigation material, and it is it is sifting out the area around the the base that you may want to be walking on, and pulling all these small particles out with some maybe even like some kind of electrostatic process. And then you're sequestering them or firing them off on some ballistic trajectory and getting them away from your from your site. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's really interesting. Um, and I guess then, or if there's like pathways that you're going to want to be walking on a regular basis and just turn that all into gravel, as opposed to walking on the talcum powder. Exactly. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, so sorry, I, I interrupted where we were. Yeah, yeah I was just gonna say, in terms of like the generating the dust or how much is gonna be there, basically, if, if you have an unprepared surface, anytime you apply a force to it, that's gonna be an opportunity to generate, uh, you know, a, a kind of uh, a plume of dust, if you will. Um, so if you're if you drive on the surface, um, if you're walking on the surface, uh, if you have some kind of equipment that's, you know, in contact with the surface, those are all places where you can start to generate dust. Um, and then, as you mentioned, the the just the natural electrostatic charge on the surface as the as the um, as the moon orbits, that does have the ability to levitate uh, some of the finest dust. And it might only be levitated centimeters, tens of centimeters off the surface, um, but that's another thing you have to be concerned about because even you know, without applying any force or doing anything that's naturally going to uh, introduce dust to the environment. I, I mean, I think that we imagine future lunar explorers going and setting up their base and exploring around on the moon and doing similar activities to like what they'll be doing on, on the space station. But how much of their time do you think will be spent just worrying about dust and the maintenance associated with it? Is it going to be a pretty big part of their lives? I think in the in the early days there'll be a lot of tri trial and error. So a lot of these technologies have been developed in the decades since Apollo, the 50 years since we were there. 
Um, and it's going to be a lot of work to figure out, you know, which of these newly proposed technologies actually works. Um, and there'll be some iteration on that. So I think once some standard practices are worked out and we kind of figure out, you know, what works, what doesn't, uh, I think that'll start to kind of fade away. Um, but sh certainly in the early days, that'll be a, 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 a top level concern. Uh, and so then, you know, have any of the, I guess, the recommendations that you're proposing, is this being considered by NASA? Like, how is this being integrated into the Artemis missions? Yeah, so NASA has, they have a lot of their own people at NASA centers, um, some of who are, are, are working on the technologies that, that we evaluated. Um, so I think they would be interested in looking at the, just the overall recommendations. Um, what we said was, uh, you know, kind of rose to the top as, as the most promising technologies. Um, and those, in theory, might get extra attention as, as we move towards, towards Artemis. That's really interesting. Um, now, how does the, you know, you focus primarily on the lunar regolith, but you mentioned there's regolith on Mercury, there's regolith on, on Mars. Um, I don't know, like if you go to Titan, is the, is the hydrocarbon or the, I guess the ice there, does that act like a regolith? So I'd like to know, like, like how is the regolith different on some of the other worlds out there? Yeah, so in general, the regolith kind of reflects the the underlying rock um, that's been broken up to, to form the regolith. So if you have different compositions of rock, that's going to be reflected uh, in the regolith you end up with. So as you said, on Titan, the, the bedrock on Titan, it, we believe, is, is mostly made of water ice. Um, and so you would expect that that would get broken up and you'd form uh, kind of a fine grains, uh, you know, sands of, of either water ice or, or these hydrocarbons. That would be so weird. Like just to, yeah. just imagine uh, that you're you know you're picking up sand, but it's it's made of ice and yet it's pulverized into these tiny little particles of, you know I'm sure we've all kind of experienced that, but it melts in our hands right away. But in this case, this stuff would be like like rock sand. Sorry, I'm just like <laughs> imagining it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like what yeah, about and then we think of other we can think of other differences like on Mars. So if we compare Mars versus the Moon. Right, Mars has an atmosphere. We have wind that can move stuff around. Uh, we know there used to be a lot more water there, and so that's affected the grains. They're more rounded; um, they've been kind of eroded. And of course, you have all the orange dust, which is a kind of a chemical weathering product of of the rocks. So you start to see some some differences there, but just based on the processes that are that are operating on these on these different bodies. But on Mars, because we have that wind and we do have that weathering, you're not going to get these little tiny glass shards that are going to, you know, will, would Martian explorers have the same kinds of health issues as well? Like, do you think it would be as bad on Mars? Um, probably not. So like you say, the, the, the lunar, the, the moon's particles in particular tend to be very sharp and angular. Um, and that's something that's of concern for when it comes into contact with, with different soft tissue. Um, Mars, because it does have that wind and did have that water, that would act to really kind of round off those those asperities, those sharp points, and you end up with something that's probably less hazardous when it, if it gets into the lungs. And and Mercury, Mercury, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a an interesting place that we haven't been out to the surface, right? So we don't know what's actually down there. There are some suggestions, though, that the the temperatures, because Mercury is so close to the sun, that the temperatures are hot enough to actually fuse the regolith grains together, kind of center them together. Uh -huh. So it's possible you could have, you know, almost like a, a smooth, compact surface rather than those fine grains. And and again, like, what would that feel like? Would that be like feel like walking on like solidified clay or? It could be, yeah. It could be kind of a, maybe it would form into kind of larger chunks or something. It's it's really hard to say without uh, without having a probe to go down to the surface. So, I have been ranting about this. We need a rover on Mercury, and a lander. Like, yeah, we yeah. don't know what it's Unfortunately, like. Unfortunately, the <laughs> the uh, NASA's decadal survey or uh, the, comes out of the National Academies. This is what they they. Tell NASA what uh, missions they should do over the next ten years, and unfortunately, Mercury and Mercury lander rover was not uh, kind of at the top there. So yeah, we'll likely have to wait some time to see that. And then I'm sort of envisioning like, what about places like I? I don't know if you saw the news fairly recently that it looks like Io seems to have sand dunes as well, but the mechanism for the dunes on on Io is like driven by 
sulfur vents that are blasting out material and so would I guess regolith on IO as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any any body that's exposed to impacts over time, you're you're going to expect naturally whatever rocks or particles you have are going to be broken up, um, broken down into smaller and smaller grains. So we really do expect almost every planetary body to be covered with a, a regolith of some sort. And then I, and then I'm imagining like say psyche, the which is like a metal, essentially a metal planetoid core, metal regolith. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's what people are, are are thinking about. There's there's kind of been a, a shift in the thinking of psyche that it, it used to be thought of as just this pure ball of metallic iron. Um, some of the recent observations have been hinting that maybe it's not pure iron uh, or pure metal. Right. Um, but yeah, people have thought about you know if if you have an impact into metal, obviously that should behave more ductile than brittle. Um, but perhaps if it's on the night side, if it's cold, you know, chilled down to liquid nitrogen ten. Uh, temperatures, then it might be brittle enough that you could break up the the metal and form a, a metallic regolith. So, you know, based on your on your research so far, like, you know, a lot of the plans for Artemis now, and even what the Chinese are, are doing with their missions is to, is to explore the south pole of the moon, look at ways to do in situ resource utilization, maybe try and harvest water ice and things like that. How, how difficult do you think in situ resource utilization from the moon building materials, how much more complicated is that going to be than, than we're hoping? I think the, the, the actual process themselves. So let's just say you have a, uh, a box that takes in ice and then electrolyzes it, splits it apart into hydrogen and oxygen. Those actual technology, those core technologies, I think are, are pretty straightforward and are not going to be that challenging. I think it's everything that goes around that, right? So how do you actually uh, dig up the ice? How do you purify it? How do you automatically load it into some kind of, into your electrolysis unit? Um, how do you, you know, purify the water because electrolysis units need very pure inputs? Um, and then once you have the hydrogen, oxygen, like how do you get it out? How do you store it? So I think, yeah, the, the actual core chemical processes and physical processes um, are, are fairly straightforward, borrowing from, from Earth technology. I think it's everything around that and developing these, these automated systems, that's going to be where a lot of the challenge is. Right. I mean, I think about things like, like storing cryogenic fuels in near vacuum is difficult. And, and that's just one piece of the puzzle. So yeah, you are able to harvest your hydrogen, your oxygen, but you're having a really hard time even just being able to store it on the moon, I can imagine each piece of this of this puzzle, the steps that you would think would work may not necessarily work. And there's going to be these, these, you know, a lack of, I'm just thinking about things like, I don't even know, like hydraulics, how will hydraulics work on the moon when you don't have the same kind of pressure, pressure differential that you have on Earth? Um, right. You know, things like a, lubricants in, in mechanical systems, right? You can't use the, the kind of oil based lubricants that we use uh, on Earth hmm. because in vacuum, those will just evaporate. So right. Or and the temperatures that so you, you may have a temperature extreme going from minus 100 to plus 100 or more of a temperature swing. It's really hard to find a lubricant that will work through that, that temperature domain. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, each piece of what we think is a traditional you dig up stuff, you extract out the stuff you want has to be re engineered from scratch. And some will be deal killers. So you, you we mentioned lubricants, we mentioned, you know, credit. what do you think are are some of the big, the biggest roadblocks you think to being able to do this? Um, I really think it's the the automation. Um, I think that's Kind of the one of the hardest pieces um you know we have if we look at like factories on earth right we have a lot of automated factories but those are very controlled environments you're, you're indoors you have you know a robotic arm that's just doing the same motion over and over on some kind of track when we actually go to the moon you're outdoors you have this complex natural environment um you know you have this undulating terrain you have the regolith and so 
taking those those systems, those robotic systems that work well in a very controlled environment and putting them into an uncontrolled environment, I think that's going to be um, quite challenging. And that's going to require a lot on the, the software side in terms of you know, machine learning, automation, AI to be able to, to overcome some of those challenges. Now, at the same time, though, we talk about, you know, here on Earth, there are downsides to doing resource extraction, there are there is rain, the atmosphere is trying to oxidize surfaces that you have, there is gravity. Um, are there some things that might actually get easier if you try to do them in space? Um, that's a good question. The well, so the one example is that when we when we mine things on Earth, we put a tremendous amount of energy into crushing the rocks. Um, if you actually look at like total world energy output, the, the energy that goes into crushing rocks and mining is, is not insignificant. Um, one thing that's nice about, we've talked about the regolith, right? Everything's being crushed up. The asteroids and comets have done all that work for us. So that's energy huh. for free that's been you know put into crushing those rocks and we can just directly use uh, that loose material uh, and save a lot of energy. And, and would there be a, like a preference? Like, would you rather use the, the powder stuff over the gravel? Um, the, I think there's kind of a sweet spot. If you get too fine grained, if you get into the real kind of talcum powder stuff, that's a lot harder to work with in terms of separating out uh, different minerals that you want from the ones that you don't want. When you get up into more sand sized grains or pebbles, that becomes a lot easier. Mm, so okay. you probably don't want to go too fine, but you also don't want to go too coarse where you have to crush stuff. But I imagine like, you know, if you've got that machine that's trying to to gravelitize the, the 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 surface around your station, it's also then using that stuff that it's pulling out and starting with that as the as the the raw material. So so not having to crush rocks. That's really interesting. I would never thought of that as a as a time saver. What else do you think? Um, I think there are certain things. So, for example, using concentrated uh, sunlight in, in different processes, if you want to run very high temperature processes, um, on Earth, you know, we have to deal with clouds, we have the attenuation through the atmosphere. And so there's a limit to how hot you can get with concentrated solar. Um, people are, are pushing that limit. Uh, I think there are some some industrial processes that are being kind of unlocked to, to use concentrated solar. Uh, but I think that's a lot more viable uh, on the moon on the moon surface uh, to heat up materials and do those kind of high temperature processes. And so like here on Earth, you've got day, you've got night, you've got clouds, you've got weather, you've got all these issues. On the moon, assuming you're, you know, you're in the permanently lit southern pole or north pole, you've got the same sunlight, almost the entire intensity, all ongoing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there are at both poles of the moon, there are these areas that are, they're called the peaks of eternal light, which is a, a bit of a misnomer. It's not 100% of the time illuminated, but about 90% of the time, uh, some of these areas you can get uh, direct solar illumination. So those would be very good for, um, you know, sighting a, a habitat or, or doing some of these more industrial processes. Uh, you, you mentioned this idea of, of sintering, and this is sort of an interesting I see this a lot in some of the comments. People are suggesting this. So, so can you explain what what sintering is? Sure. So, with sintering, what you're trying to do is you're t trying to take a material that's a powder, uh, so a granular material, and you're trying to put some strength back into it so it behaves like a competent uh, block. And the way it works is you you take your powder. Um, usually those are very controlled uh, for earth-based sintering. So you have like one grain size, you have a, a homogenous powder, and then you heat it up and you don't heat it up to the point where it completely melts. You just heat it up to the point where you start to get a little bit of melting on the edges of the grains. And that liquid then bonds together, it fuses together those grains into a hard material. So you heat it up to about three quarters of the temperature that it would melt at. Um, that's where you can start to get sintering. So you're taking a, a powder material and turning it into something competent and strong. Hmm. And does the like the composition matter, or is it like can it be used on fairly like a rough mix of material, or do you need to purify it to a certain extent? Um, so usually for for earth based manufacturing, you're going to be working with something very pure, very homogeneous, just one material. Uh, and this can be done for ceramics, can be done for metals, different types of materials. 
Um, I don't think typically you would want to have something kind of mixed or dirty, um, but on the moon you might have to you might have to do that just because that's what you have to work with the the natural regolith. Um, and so people are are working on different technologies to try and apply sintering to the, the to that regolith that you would find there. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, uh, and, you know, I, t I mentioned like earlier, you know, some of the things that the moon or the earth has that the moon doesn't have, we're just dealing with this here, we're, we're pouring some concrete and the weather has been so terrible, that the concrete company has said, like, we haven't been able to do any finishing on any concrete jobs for months. Now we're way behind schedule, because it just won't stop raining. Um, it'll never rain on the moon. And so does the lack of weather give you something a more dependable environment on that extent? It does, but it's also challenging at the same time. So for example, concrete, um, you know, concrete is, is made in a slurry, it's kind of wet, and then it has to cure over quite a long period, you know, several weeks, maybe up to a month to cure. That's not going to be possible in outdoors on the moon in, in a vacuum environment. Um, the water is just going to completely, uh, you know, desiccate and dry out. So people have tried to come up with other ideas. Maybe you could use molten sulfur as, as kind of the binder or the cement. Um, or, you know, people are working on just directed energy to kind of 3D print uh, by melting the regolith or, you know, extruding it uh, as a as kind of a lava almost. So that so like, trying to just like pour concrete in a traditional sense is not going to work. But right. you have to kind of go back to find other ways to make and or back to the sintering idea. Yeah, yeah, it's all the same problem of, you know, you have a, a powder, you want to give it strength. And so you need some kind of binder. And that binder could be a material that you bring or source on the moon, um, or you can, you know, use heat to start to melt it and then kind of have it make its own binder in a way. So what is next now? You know, you've, you've submitted your recent, you just published this recent journal article. What comes next for your research? Yeah. So, I mean, I do a lot of work right now on uh, deposits of, of uh, ice at the poles of the moon. So trying to figure out where they are, uh, what they're like, how we could tap into those uh, for more sustainable exploration. Uh, and then I also do a lot of regolith based work. So uh, we create simulated regolith uh, here in the lab to, to work with. Uh, we also, uh, we can request samples from NASA. So we have some samples. We're trying to do some That's cool. very detailed characterization of the, the grain sizes and the grain shapes. Um, so actually, you actually get to play with moon samples. Yes. Oh, yes. that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's a flurry of, of technology going to the moon, there's various rovers, various experiments going. Are there some fundamental questions that you would like to have answered that would help you with your work? Yeah, I think the if we look at the the ice in particular, we, there's still a ton that we don't know about the, about the ice at the poles of the moon. We know there is some ice there. Um, but uh, it's the the evidence, we have a lot of conflicting evidence for how much it is, how deep it is. Um, it's certainly not like it is uh, on Mars where, you know, you have polar ice caps and it's right there at the surface. Um, we think the moon, it might be buried uh, quite a bit deeper, it might be mixed in with the regolith. So I think some of these missions that are starting to go to the poles, uh, Viper, for example, I think we'll start to get a lot more information um, about the, the nature of those ice deposits. I think, you know, for the longest time, people thought that the inner solar system was bone dry because of the, the solar radiation. And not out until you get out beyond the frost line, will you actually start to find some of these volatiles. But I think some of the interesting research into say, uh, asteroid Bennu with Osiris Rex and with Hayabusa, that maybe there is more volatiles trapped just below the surface. Do you, you know, do you think that that the moon will be a source of of these other what what would have previously been thought to be fairly rare uh chemicals yeah so i think there's there's kind of been two things that have uh two lines of research that have, have changed our picture of the inner solar system so one is recognizing that those bone dry building blocks um, were not completely dry and that if you just have a, a fraction of, of a percent of water in the the stuff that built the earth and the moon and mars um that's, not, that's actually enough to give you you know oceans if you bring all that water out onto the mm. uh, onto the surface um the other thing is just our understanding of the dynamics of the solar system how a different material has moved around and in particular recognizing that a lot of the wet stuff that formed in the outer solar system was probably brought in 
uh, in the form of, of asteroids and comets. And that's kind of been a, a delivery of more water rich material uh, to the inner solar system. Um, but for the moon, I think, you know, there are different, uh, there are different forms that, that water can take. So we know that some of the uh, volcanic glasses that, that have erupted on the moon uh, contain a small amount of water, uh, maybe hundreds of parts per million. Um, and then, you know, this evolving story of, of ice at the poles and, and not just yeah. water ice, but other compounds, maybe CO2 ice, uh, methane ice. So I think as we as we learn more, we'll find that there's, uh, you know, a good variety of, of, of different volatile elements. Do you think it's all there? Do you think everything that we need is there? Do you think that that there could be theoretically a self sustaining lunar habitat to some extent? So every element on the periodic table is present on every planetary body. And the real question is, what is the concentration? So right. that determines whether, you know, on Earth, whether you have a, something that can be used as a resource or not is the concentration. So how much of the, the stuff that you want divided by, you know, the total mass of, of a, a block of the crust. And so on Earth, when we, when we mine resources, we go to these very, very specific locations, these ore deposits or ore bodies where certain elements have been, been concentrated um, many orders of magnitude uh, above the kind of the, the average uh, composition of the Earth. So on the moon, you know, we haven't had a lot of those same processes to create those ore deposits. So it's going to be pretty challenging to get certain elements uh, like lithium or rare earth elements. Um, but there is a lot of just kind of bulk material uh, that we could use for construction. Um, there is, you know, these ice deposits that we could start to use for propellant for life support. So I, I don't know whether politically you would ever necessarily want to have or need to have a, a self-sustaining uh, settlement on the moon, given that it's it's three days away. Yeah, um, yeah. Think, you know, there's no one trying to make a, a self-sustaining settlement in Antarctica, which is also three days away if you wanted to, to travel there. So Even quicker, I think that's yeah. that's more of a, a thing for Mars. Uh, makes a lot more sense given the given the distance. Well, so let's extend that then to Mars. Uh, do you think that Mars has, you know, like, like Elon Musk has said, he wants to make a city on a self sustaining city on Mars, um, you know, and and whether or not that's a great idea. Um, do you think that's feasible? I, I, I do think it is. Um, so Mars has a couple advantages. The, the first is that it has that CO2 atmosphere. It's not a thick atmosphere, it's fairly thin, but you know, that gives you a source of carbon um, that you really don't have all that much of on, on the moon. Um, so that's really useful if you want to do any kind of um, biological synthesis and life support. Um, so that's really important. You do have much more abundant water. Um, the ice on Mars is, is everywhere. We know where it is. We can see it. Um, and you have a, a greater variety of minerals just because Mars is a, is a bigger planetary body. It's had more geology, more processing. Um, so more chance to concentrate certain elements. And some of those have been discovered by the, the rover missions. So I think in a lot of ways, um, if there's a place where you want to do that in the solar system, it, it makes sense to do it on Mars. Um, but then like, what would be the what would be a limiting factor, something that we take for granted here on Earth and use all the time, but actually would be quite rare and difficult to get your hands on on Mars? Um, so I think the I think what's gonna be pretty difficult would be materials for, uh, for generating and storing energy. So on Earth, you know, we use fossil fuels, obviously, we're not going to have those on Mars. Um, we use very high purity silicon for, for solar panels, we use lith lithium for batteries. So a lot of those kinds of materials related to energy uh, are going to be pretty difficult things, even, you know, uranium for, for fission reactors. Um, so that's going to be a challenge. I think a lot of that's going to have to be imported. Um, a lot of the things that go into uh, complex electronics, uh, those are going to be uh, a challenge as well. So you're going to have to very slowly ramp up your ability to make those things in situ on Mars over time. You're going to have to put in more and more energy and get more creative with the, the processing. But like basic chemicals like, say, phosphorus or nitrogen are relatively abundant? Um. There's a little bit of them. They're they're pretty tough to uh, they're, they're not found in these these big concentrated deposits. 
Um, but then on earth, you know, most of the nitrogen and phosphorus are used as fertilizer for, for growing crops. And perhaps you don't have a system on Mars where you're using soil to, to feed your population. Maybe right. you're using hydroponics or uh, growing things in, in bioreactors. So maybe some of those aren't, aren't as necessary. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> there's been several uh, asteroid mining companies that have been founded and have since gone out of business. And the joke that we make around here is the best way to, I guess, spend all your money is to start an asteroid mining company. Um, do you think that <clears throat> that it will ever be feasible to gather resources from space and return them back to Earth? So I'd say the main goal of, of space resources is to extract resources in space to be used in space. I don't think there's a lot of use case to, to bring things back. There may be a very narrow set of resources and these would be things like the, the platinum group metals, um, you know, something like rhodium that sells for $500,000 a kilogram. Maybe once you bring Starship into the mix and you could, you know, actually land 50 tons, bring back 50 tons uh, from, from space. Maybe there's a very narrow case for, for something like that. But I think really the, the whole point of, of this is to support the expansion of humanity into space and to actually use those resources uh, locally where you find them. So, so I guess how long until we can start making von Neumann probes, do you think? <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause that's the automation problem. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tricky parts to making self-replicating robot probes that will fly out and explore the universe for us. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Mars is the, the first step. Um, and then, but I don't think it's the last step, right? If we're going to expand that far, it's because that's kind of in our nature to just keep expanding. So I think then after Mars, you're looking ahead to, to Ceres, the asteroid belt as kind of stepping stones to the outer solar system. And then, you know, eventually I think we will go beyond that. Um, perhaps we need a uh, better understanding of physics to be able to go a lot faster um, to, to make those distances tractable. Um, but I think as long as it doesn't you know, violate the, the laws of physics as we understand them, then I think we will keep expanding. Well, I always say that, you know, we had Oumuamua and Borisov. So if like a rock can make the journey, then in theory, a smart rock can make the journey that we that we yeah. would, we would form. Uh, yeah. Well, Kevin, it's been absolutely fascinating. What is the best way for people to follow your work or to keep track of, of, of the work you're doing at the Colorado School of Mines? Yes, I think uh, googling my name uh, will get you there. Um, on Twitter is KM Cannon, C-A-N-N-O-N. Um, and uh, I have a blog on Substack, so I'm kind of have a uh, you know small presence online that people can uh, can follow along. Fantastic. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Exciting uh, and challenging to think about the the issues that we're going to have to deal with as we try to go back to space and stay there and explore outward. But uh, it sounds like lots of people are are working on ideas. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on. All right. Good luck. <laughs>